50 years ago, it's going to make some of us feel a little old. Francis Schaeffer published his first book, The God Who Is There, 1968. And uh, my only interaction, actually, with Francis Schaeffer was at a conference in 1977. And I'd been a Christian for, I don't know, a year or so, and um, thick as a log. (laughs) And um, (laughs) what I remember about that is I had the impression, two things. One was whatever this guy's saying is really important. And the other impression I had was, I have no idea what he's talking about. (laughs) So I spent the next 40 some years trying to figure it out. And so I wanna speak this evening a little bit about um, a couple of the things that are the enduring legacy of Francis Schaeffer's work, and I wanna weave them into a couple of important points that we wanna discuss here this evening. He's a guy who you can hear his voice subtly if you listen to pretty much every teaching you hear in this fellowship. That's how important his influence has been. I can't think of any other single human author who has influenced this fellowship to the extent that he has. And he has for a couple of really important reasons. One is this deep conviction that we must make a biblical case for Christ in every generation, and what was so revolutionary about the God who is there is that it was the first real movement of biblically-minded Christians to understand in a deep way the shifts that were taking place in our culture away from a basically Christian consensus or Christian worldview and how practically to speak to it. And his point was that if we are not reading carefully our culture in the light of God's word, we will lose our voice, and every generation has that responsibility. The second conviction that comes from this book is that to really speak effectively to our culture, we have to begin with fundamental questions like, what is truth, and how do we know it? And so that's really what I want to talk about here this evening, is this very foundational, this very basic question. Schaefer says in The God Who Is There, the concept of the way we come to knowledge and truth is the most crucial problem, as I understand it, facing Christianity today. Well, nothing could be truer uh, than to say the same thing in our day. You know, we live in a culture that is now called the post-truth culture. Things have changed radically in our lifetime, and who knows where it's heading in the future. But one thing we do know is that if we're going to have effective, redemptive engagement with our culture, it is going to be because we're understanding the fundamental framework of what is truth and how do we know it. And so with that in mind, I want to talk this evening about what we're calling here the ways of knowing, the basic biblical view of the nature of truth and how we know it. And what we find is as we search the scripture and we ask this deep question, what is truth and how do we know it, that we're presented with a holistic picture of both of these things. Holistic in the sense that it speaks to the totality of who we are as people. And because that is true, it enables us to have real insight into the world, real insight into how everyone made in the image of God understands. So there's a place to connect. But this is where we begin. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, the most important verse in all of Torah for most Jews, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then the next verse, verse 5, the call to love God with your total being. And then in verses 6 to 8, Moses says, These words I'm commanding you today shall be on your hearts. And you shall teach them diligently. And you shall talk of them when you sit at home and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals for your forehead. And so I've underlined important words here that kind of get to the range of what we mean when we talk about truth and knowing. The heart, the hands, the head. 
The knowledge of God is manifested, therefore, in the breadth of human experience. It's what we do. It's how we're feeling with the inner life that we have. It's an intellectual concept as well. And Schaefer says this. He says, our primary calling is to truth as it is rooted in God, his acts and revelation. And if indeed truth, uh, if indeed it is truth, it touches all of reality and all of life. So there's a comprehensiveness that he's pointing to in what we mean by truth. So our case for Christ then emerges from this holistic understanding of what knowledge is rooted in Scripture, applied to the world of our experience, and lived out before the watching world. And that really is kind of the thesis that we want to drive with you here this evening. Well, if we're to have knowledge of God in the head, the heart, and the hands, these are the places that we find truth, and this is how truth is known. What do we mean by that? Well, the head, of course, represents being rational. There's an objective world out there to be known. Truths about the world that are true, whether we choose to believe it or not, they're there. There is a real world. And we have access to truth about that world through the exercise of reason. But that's not the end of what knowledge is. Knowledge also relates to the heart. There's a, what we could call an inner subjectivity and an intersubjectivity. In other words, the truth, in this sense, has a personal dimension. We're aware of ourselves as individuals. We're aware of ourselves as conscious beings. And at the same time, we are aware that there are other conscious persons or conscious entities. And so while it may be possible to know all kinds of things that are true about a person through observation, there is yet another layer of knowledge that comes interpersonally as we connect soul to soul, mind to mind, heart to heart. It will be possible to think about this in the sense that of, you know, it's one thing to, to have biographical knowledge of a person. I, I love biographies. A few years ago, I became a little bit of a, uh, a Teddy Roosevelt expert. I read Desmond Morris's three-volume biography of Teddy Roosevelt. Thousands of pages of the most arcane detail you can imagine. I have forgotten almost all of it. But here's the thing. I know a lot about Teddy. But if he and I were to meet on the street someday, he would not know who I am. And I wouldn't really know him as well either. Because there's something more about knowing than just knowing about. There is a personal dimension to knowledge. Write my scriptures, he says, on your hearts. And then thirdly, of course, is the knowledge that comes from doing. When reality says yes to you taking action on what your mind has told you and your heart has convinced you is true and you act, and that action works in the real world, that also produces a certain level of knowledge. So let's think about this again from the biblical point of view. Head knowledge, the intellect, just as Luke tells us in his, his prologue to the Gospel of Luke. Many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. They've handed these things down through eyewitnesses, having investigated everything carefully, Luke says, writing out for you in consecutive order so that, he says, you might know the exact truth of the things that you've been taught. Well, that's, that's an important kind of knowledge, isn't it? It's a knowledge based on observation, on witnesses, on multiple witnesses, on reliable sources communicated in consecutive order. There is, co there is a, an interest in detail and capturing in words the events that are being recorded in the, about the life of Christ and the person of Christ. So that's a kind of head knowledge. But that's not the end of knowledge. There's more. So Paul in Ephesians 1 prays, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you will know. Not just feel. Know. That there's a personal kind of knowledge, a connection 
between the mind of God and our mind, the Spirit of God and the Spirit within us. A connection that Paul is praying that we become increasingly aware of, the product of which is knowledge, intimate, personal knowledge of the mind of God. He goes on in his prayer in in chapter 3, he says, he prays that they would know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. To know something that surpasses knowing. Okay? So it's a, it's a different kind of knowing. It's not something that you can put your hands around. It's not what you see with your senses. It's something that emerges from the connection of one soul to another. But it's real knowledge. It's personal. And then the knowledge that comes from doing. Hebrews 5, verse 14, of course, solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. As you take action and you put into practice the things that you've learned, a new kind of knowledge begins to emerge. It's called discernment here. Or as Jesus says in Matthew 11, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And so here's the framework of knowledge that God has brought to us as persons. An intellectual, a personal, and a practical dimension of knowing. All three of which are fundamental to our our experience of God, our knowledge of God, and indeed the knowledge of all of the things in the world that God has placed us. And so to build on that a bit, we want to think about our own Bible study in pursuit of the knowledge of God. All of these elements are important. So, for instance, the ability to correctly interpret a text of Scripture, to do exegesis, the hard mental work of understanding what the author intended the meaning of the text to be. That is a responsibility that we have, and it produces a kind of knowledge of God's Word. But that's not enough. There is also the need to reflect and to meditate on the truths of God because that yet produces another kind of knowledge, a personal knowledge, an intimacy that we have with God. And finally, if we are understanding, if we are our, our souls are connecting in a real way mediated through the words of Scripture, with the mind and heart of God, and we are sensing uh, that, that still small voice of God illuminating truth that's relevant to the moment, that's relevant to our own situation. That knowledge is not complete until it manifests itself in action. And once I take action on the basis of my Bible study that has brought me meditation, And I say, okay, what do I do? Not someday, today, with these things that I've learned from God's Word. That completes this picture of knowledge that God has for us. All of those things are important. All of them must be working together. All of them together produce the effect of real transformation in our lives. A new and fresh way of viewing ourselves, our world, and our God. To limit our understanding of the knowledge of God to any one of these three areas would be catastrophic. For us to leave Bible study at the uh, altar of, of our inductive Bible study would be interesting, but ultimately not transformative. We would not really be sensing the presence of God, the leading of God. We wouldn't be able conversing and fellowship and having that personal knowledge of God. But similarly, if we don't take action on the convictions that God lays on our heart as we are before Him prayerfully reading His Word, we're going to be the forgetful hearer and not the effectual doer that James 1 talks about. So all of these things work together to build our relationship with God, to build true knowledge of God. But we then want to then connect this same approach to knowing to the broader world in which we live out these things that we have come to know as true about God. And so we can speak, as as philosophers and people like that do, of propositional truth. 
truth that is intellectual, truth that is contained in statements of objective fact, facts about the world, facts that are measurable and accessible to reason. We can think about truth as personal truth, our understanding of ourselves, our inner lives, and the inner lives of others, and practical truth, which is the truth that comes as we apply these things to the real world, as we do. And there is a lot at stake, it seems to me, in our understanding of knowledge defined in this holistic context. Let's think about this just for a moment. There are tests, then, for truth. How do we know that propositionally, personally, or practically, we are entering into a deeper awareness of truth, what we would call knowledge? How would we know that? Well, I think it's been instructive to go back to a definition that was given to us about 2,400 years ago by Plato when he defined knowledge as justified true belief. And people have take an issue with various parts of this definition, but is more or less held that to know something, to know truth in each of these areas requires that the, that, that the object of our knowledge is actually existing, that it is true. It's not possible to know something that ain't so, okay? I cannot know that my wife is a lemon. I cannot know that my daughter is an aardvark. These things are not possible to know because they don't correspond to reality as it is. So to know something, it must be true. It must be believed to be true. It makes no sense to say, yeah, I know that the earth revolves around the sun, but I just, I just don't believe it. Okay, that doesn't make sense. To, to include belief in our definition of knowledge, it says that, that there is an activity of the will where we are We are choosing to accept as true a proposition that we believe to be true. That's going to be important later in our conversation this evening. And then lastly, knowledge is defined in terms of the terms of justification. What reason do we have to believe that what we have regarded to be true is in fact the case? What are the conditions of justification? What are the reasons, the rationale, for accepting it as such? And so in propositional truth, we apply logic, scientific method, the canons of historical research, things like that that enable us to get at the evidence that is before us and arrange it in ways that that truly represent the way reality actually is. In terms of personal truth, we get access to, we justify our beliefs within based upon the nature of relationship. It's more of an intuitive kind of understanding. The justification is different. It's more of an immediate awareness, a knowledge that comes through experience of that other person, that other mind. Or within, conscience actually fits uh, this sort of knowledge as well. Conscience. In English, conscience is is the conjunction of of two parts of speech coming from the Latin con, with, and scientia, which means knowledge. That's where the word science comes from. And it has always been understood that, that that the awareness of moral truths, the sense of myself as a moral agent, is a kind of knowing. It's a different kind of knowing than knowing things about the external world, but it is real knowledge, real insight. And so the the pull of conscience serves to justify our understandings, our instincts, our, our, our sense of what is true and fa- or right and wrong, just or unjust. And then finally, in terms of justification, in the practical world that we live in, when we take what we believe to be true about the way the world operates, and we develop technologies and interventions that actually work in the real world that corroborates or justifies that truth claim that we are making. So these are the things that, in that broad sense, when we talk about truth, and we talk about knowing the truth, these are the things that we're talking about. 
Now, we've been talking about them in the abstract, and I want to get a little bit more practical as we move into this section of our talk here tonight. Because the reality is that the holistic view of truth and knowing that the Bible describes is not, has not been held by most secular thinking in our world in a very harmful way. So, Schaefer says, again citing him, um, he says, the Christian system, that is, what the Bible teaches, is a unity of thought. Christianity is not just a lot of bits and pieces. There's a beginning and an end, a whole system of truth. And this system is the only system that will stand up to all the questions that are really presented to us as we face the reality of existence. Some of the other systems answer some of the questions, but leave others unanswered. He says, I believe that it is only Christianity that gives answers to all the crucial questions. And so now, the, what he is saying here is just of extraordinary importance, practically as well as conceptually. I like to think about it like this. To try to put together the pieces that make up the world of our experience when our assumptions about what is true and what it means to know the truth are inadequate. And Schaefer's point in the Bible, I think, declares unequivocally that when we start from the limitations of our own human experience, when we try to reason from what I see, what I sense within, how I try to make things work, it, 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 it leaves the questions that must be answered unanswered and a movement toward skepticism and cynicism and a giving up of ideas altogether. In our own culture, this has really progressed over a period of time. When we think about knowledge, and all we think about is propositional content, knowledge of the external world, verified by science, independently and opposed to, in fact, personal dimensions and practical dimensions of knowledge. What we're left with is what was, come, what was termed in the 20th century positivism. It's had a rebirth among the new atheists in our own day. But it's basically the idea that we limit what we mean by truth and therefore what it means to, be, to know truth to the merely physical. So that science then is elevated to the standard of truth that, that if it can be measured by uh, the tools of scientific research, the standards of scientific truth, then it can be known. Apart from that, any statement is, is meaningless and falls outside the realm of what we know. And so these philosophers of what was then called the Vienna Circle, scientists, philosophers, people from all areas of the academic world really began to, to, to define in the early 20th century the framework of what modern people should view as truth and knowing. And because it reduced everything down to a mathematical equation or a scientific principle, then some of the deeper things that don't seem to fit well into a test tube were left out, regarded as meaningless. Moral truths, personal truths, questions about human existence and human meaning, the question of God. These things are left outside of the realm of what's knowledge. And therefore, any kind of belief in these areas was termed by one of the great minds of this era, Sigmund Freud, as illusion. Now the question is, why do you have these beliefs about things that cannot be scientifically verified, like God? He doesn't fit well into a test tube. How can you say we know him? Well, it is because of a breakdown in your psyche, a a, an infantile need for your father to protect you from the absurdity and meaninglessness of the world that you then create God in your own image. 
And so that belief in God, belief in, in human dignity, belief in, in a moral system is, is a form of neurosis. And that is really part of the narrative that has been driving Western civilization for certainly over a century. But because of the obvious limitations that this brings to the field of knowledge, there has been in the last generation a reaction against that from positivism to postmodernism. And here, now we don't care about the objective truth, about the objective world, and we certainly don't care about truth in practice. But we reduce all knowledge down to personal experience, or maybe more broadly, cultural experience. And so, we don't think of truth in the objective sense. We think of my truth, our truth, versus your truth, or their truth. And this kind of cynical relativism has, has really added to the sense of fragmentation that we see in our own culture today. It's never been more visible than turning on the, the, the television now. We are a deeply divided society. There's all manner of us's and them's out there. And if this is all we have, the truth is generated from within then there's no reconciling our differences. And what we become then is increasingly alienated, increasingly hostile toward one another, increasingly cynical, and in a dangerous way. In the words of the great pre-modern, postmodern Thrasymachus, friend to Socrates, justice is simply the interest of the stronger. And so now we just live in a culture where people are trying to vie for cultural influence, for their version of truth to dominate, and there's no common ground to resolve our differences. What a lonely and broken place this is. Do you agree? That is the culture that we live in. Well, some have said, okay, truth cannot be just reduced to science, and it certainly is not just a subjective construct of my own belief system, my own personal belief. Truth, instead of being practical, we'll call it pragmatism. And, and we hear that around as well. I don't, I don't want to be ideological. Let's just be pragmatic. In other words, truth is what works, and that's really all we have. That's all we can talk about. But saying the truth works is a very incomplete sentence. Don't trust the people who say that. Because we have to ask the question, works for who? And to what end? Slavery worked. For some, not for others. And to what end? Pragmatism is an incomplete sentence. And so the, we appreciate, in this sense, the biblical, holistic view that knowledge is, is objective and universal, accessible to reasonable minds, rational minds, that truth is personal and interpersonal, and that truth is practical in the sense that reality says yes to our ideas when they are right. But, you know, it's also true that we have difficulty in our own culture, in our own Christian culture, in the area of truth. That Christians, just like the secular world around us, tend to be reductionistic and, and privilege one notion of truth over the others to really horrible results. There's a sterile intellectualism that many of us are used to, and Francis Schaeffer called this dead orthodoxy. It's that we've got all the right answers to all the right questions, our creeds are correct, and our interpretation of the Bible is spot on. But it is a loveless and lifeless kind of orthodoxy. It is a truth devoid of the personal and the practical dimensions. And it's those things that the world tends to look at and see the vast gulf between Christians and themselves. Well, more recently, I suppose, would be a, a, a privileging or prioritization of mystical experience. 
over the objective truth statements of the scripture or the practical living out of these things. What Schaefer called in one of his latter books, the new super spirituality. He saw this coming. He recognized as truth decays in our culture and experience is elevated, that Christians will come to ape the culture just like everybody else. Now, he's not saying, and we're certainly not saying, that experience is not important. It's very important, and it's an important part of knowing. But it's not knowing independently of doctrinal knowing, objective knowing, or practical knowing. And lastly, what is putting into practice the Bible without a careful understanding of the indicatives, the truths that underlie the prescriptions of Scripture? What does it mean to do the things that Scripture does without a sense of real priority, as Jesus said, um, doing your tithing and so forth, but leaving out the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and goodness? That's legalism. That's what it is. It's Christian doing independent of a deep personal connection with God and an understanding of His Word. And so what we want to really bring together then is a holistic way of understanding who we are as Christians in connection to the God that we worship and the world that we're called to serve. What does it mean to have a holistic apologetic? Well, I think here we get a lot of help from the God who is there. Schaefer says, our calling is different. He says, it is to exhibit God and His character by His grace in this generation. We need to show forth Him as personal, as holy, and as love. What is he saying here? He's saying we exhibit the Lord. Exhibit A. Propositional revelation. Exhibit B, what he called the final apologetic. Exhibit C, the livability of biblical truth. Let's just very briefly break this down. Propositional truth. Propositions are statements that are either true or false. That's what we mean by propositional truth. I'm standing on this stage before you tonight. That's either true or it's not. Right? I'm sitting on an orange crate in southern Haiti. Not true. It's a proposition, but it's not true. So propositional truth is either, propositional statements are either true or false. And the Bible declares from the very beginning that God has spoken. God's speech, God's word is the beginning act. The first thing that God does As he speaks, he says, let there be light and so forth. God speaks. And as he speaks, things happen. And we see his speech manifested in his works. That's what science is. We can make sense out of the world of of our experience, out of the cosmos, because it is the product of an infinite personal God who created for a reason. And so there is an orderliness, a predictability in nature itself that allows science to function, and it can function because it is the product, not of random chance, but of actual design by a God who speaks, and therefore we can know. And that same God who speaks order, intelligibility, design into nature speaks the same into history, that history is defined in terms of the promises that God makes, the faithfulness of God to those promises, and the ultimate act in which God takes on human flesh, lives, suffers, dies, and is resurrected on behalf of the humanity that is in rebellion against Him. And these are things that we can know because they are a part of the objective world that is made knowable by an infinite and personal God who who speaks, who uses language, who makes intelligible things that rational minds can perceive and understand. And as well, if we understand from the propositional content of Scripture, what does it mean to be human? 
that we are able to speak to things that the world, with its truncated understanding of what is true and what is real, can never grasp, which is that humankind has dignity, but is plagued by moral failure and has depravity as well. You know, think about this. If we only have just um, a, a scientific observation, and that's the limits of our understanding of what is true, and we have assumed that the, the cosmos as we know it has, come up, or has arisen, not from a, the, the product of an infinite and personal God, but out of some sort of random chance, some sort of a, unexplainable natural phenomenon, then you as a human being also are a part of that system which is inherently meaningless, purposeless. And while you may be more complicated, more sophisticated, more complex than a petri dish of bacteria, you are ultimately of no more significance or value. And it's in relation to the God who speaks, the God who creates humanity in his own image, who endows him with those very personal capacities to have relationship, to be able to understand truth, to form bonds, to experience love, to understand moral distinction. That is only possible within the Christian framework, the biblical framework. So, in that sense, biblical Christianity becomes the highest form of, of humanism, of dignity, and at the same time explains what's really wrong with humanity, that the narrative of human history is man's inhumanity to man, the failures that we consistently make at every turn. Why? It's because that inherently we are broken and we are separated from God. That's why. So there are good and sufficient answers to reality as we see it, understood from the biblical perspective that cannot be understood in the same way, from a different starting point. Schaefer says, the solution given in the Bible answers the problem of the universe and man, and nothing else does, and that's right, and that's really important. But it's not enough. It's important that we are able to argue our case based upon the hypothesis that there is a God that explains the phenomena of science and history. And you're going to hear in the second half of our talk tonight, Sean McDowell laying out historical arguments for why we can trust in the Scriptures and what they teach us about Jesus Christ. Why rational people can maintain a robust faith but that's not going to be enough. There's more. And so Schaefer speaks of the final apologetic, a personal knowledge that is different, rooted in the high priestly prayer of John 17, verses 20 and 21, where Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now he's appealing to something different than the preamble to Luke in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It's a different kind of evidence that he's talking about here. Schaefer goes on, he says, We cannot expect the world to believe that the Father sent the Son, that Jesus' claims are true, that Christianity is true, unless the world sees some reality of the oneness of true Christians. Well, I'll just think about that for a minute. He says, now that is frightening. Should we not feel some emotion at this point? Indeed, we should. Because there's more involved in, in presenting the case for Christ than our our arguments, as important and foundational as they are. I had a, a good friend many years ago. He was a biochemist at a, 
pharmaceutical company in Chicago, and he was not a Christian, and he was actually pretty bitter, the whole concept of God. And we spent many evenings together, Steve and I did, and we walked through the evidence for God, and we walked through the evidence for Christ and the resurrection, and, and over a period of time, he sort of softened, and, and it was clear that he was like, okay, you know, maybe. That's plausible. I grant that. And nothing changed but one thing, and that is that, that a mutual friend of ours began to play a significant role in Steve's life. She was a folk singer. And basically what she did was she just took passages of the Bible and put them to music, and she sang. And she had a bit of a following among many of our friends there in Chicago. She was just an extraordinary musician. And Steve listened, and, and he told me, after several months, he said, okay, I've heard enough. What I'm hearing now, though, is resonating deeply in my heart. There is something that I'm hearing in this music, in this song, that you've not been able to communicate to me through these arguments. A reality of the presence of God. And I'm ready to become a Christian. And so that man, that super sophisticated research scientist, who was not swayed by evidence alone, found a personal knowledge of God by this other element of evidence that God had brought to him through music. Christianity is plausible, but is it compelling? That's really the question that uh, uh, emerges at this point. The reality is that there's a difference between knowing and knowing about. And so objective evidence is necessary, but it is not sufficient. The reality is that in terms of a personal relationship, which is what we're calling people to in our evangelism, there is an element of trust that has to be involved to make a decision to choose to believe in a person and the efficacy of that person from the most foundational need in your life requires more than intellectual data. It requires as well an awareness a personal knowledge within. And this is what Jesus is referring to here. The reality of interpersonal evidence. A community of people connected to each other on the basis of grace and love. That's the final apologetic, Schaefer says. That has to be a part. that God has invested his reputation before the watching world in the church's ability to be unified and to be unified, I don't know how to say this nicely, to be unified with weirdos like you and me, okay? With all our brokenness and strangeness, to be able to rise above that and practice a kind of love that accepts and affirms and, and because we are broken, must forgive and move toward and bear burdens. And to be able to live this out before the watching world is powerful evidence. I have another friend. We'll call him Steve as well because, well, that's his name. <laughs> and Steve was also a pretty skeptical seeker. He was kind of a 60s leftover, a hippie little crispy on the outside, soft on the inside, but curious. He showed up to our Bible study the first time wearing a jester's hat. He was sending notice. I'm not sure I take this very seriously, but we became friends, and we began to meet on a very regular basis, and we would read um, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, books like that, and and I'd, say, I'd be saying, Steve, so, you know, what's your take on all of this kind of stuff? And he'd be like, yeah, well, you know, I feel like you guys are all in the, in the living room around your warm fire. And there's something beautiful going on in there. And I'm kind of, I'm out on the porch. I said, okay. 
Are you looking in? Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking in. Okay. And so he continued to, be, to participate in our Christian community. We continued to meet together and to read and to talk about Christ over a period of time. I'd be like, Steve, it's been a few weeks since I've asked you. Where are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm inching towards the door, Jim. Okay, sweet. And months went by, and we continued to have this conversation. Steve, where are you? I, I'm at the door, Jim. I'm like, that's awesome. What are you going to do? He said, I think I'm going to open that door. I think I'm going to come in. So you want to be a part of this thing, right? He goes, yeah, I do. I just, there's something powerful that I'm beginning to sense that I cannot reject any longer. And I'm like, okay, cool. And so he says, but I'm not ready to do that here. I don't want to receive Christ with you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. <laughs> he says, I want to go to, to the home church. And I want to pray there with my brothers and sisters. Because there's just no way I'd believe that this was true if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Here's a guy who had lived in Providence, Rhode Island, in the kind of East Coast counterculture, looking for community, looking for authenticity, looking for real connection, seeking like-minded people to find it, and he couldn't find it. And he was so embittered by that, so cynical. But it was the witness of the body of Christ that produced knowledge of the love of God, and that drew him to himself. Then lastly, there is this question of livability that Schaefer brings us to as he thinks through the holistic approach to apologetics in his book, The God Who Is There. He makes this point that we must be able to live consistently with our assumptions. That livability piece. It's not enough to hold beliefs and say that they're true if they're not tested in the real world. If they're not applied and lived out. And so he says, in reality... No one can live logically according to his own non-Christian presuppositions. And consequently, because he is faced with the real world and himself in practice, you will find a place where you can talk. That's right. And how important that is. In a culture like ours, where we have eviscerated the whole concept of knowledge to just something that is self-affirming, and, and makes me different than you. The reality is we still live in God's world and we are still creatures in the image of God. And we cannot live consistently with assumptions that are not biblical assumptions about what does it mean to be human. And we are always living that contradiction. Are we? Yeah. Every time we make moral judgments and we say, Some, that's wrong, it shouldn't be like that. What are we assuming? We're assuming that there's a standard of goodness or of justice that's greater than myself that I and others ought to yield to. So the moralist in our society who is outside the framework of biblical truth is stuck between his own knowledge inwardly that certain things are just plain wrong and should ought not be and his confession, his belief that, hey, we all kind of make up our own narrative as it goes. And for that reason, as Schaefer says, there's always a place for us to talk. We can always connect with and identify with the better aspirations of people around us and help them to understand that the only way, the only way this deeply held belief could possibly be true is if the God of the Bible existed. And that's effective. When we speak of human rights, or human dignity, it's the same thing. What makes this life worth sacrificing for? What makes this other person's life have a, a, a burden, of, an obligation on me to, to act in a certain kind of way? That's, that's not true in any other universe other than the one in which there is a God, an infinite and personal God in whose image all people are made. And so we will always have a place to communicate. We will never find ourselves as Christians, whether we are at work or with, with non-Christian family members or our neighbors, we will never be at a place where there's not common ground for us to talk because everyone has basic moral motions. 
and passionately held convictions in these areas. And where it becomes possible for us then to just move into this question of what makes that possible, what gives that substance. And when we put these things together, the propositional, the personal, the practical, this question of livability, what we have is a significant, powerful witness for Jesus Christ. Our case for Christ emerges from a holistic knowledge rooted in Scripture and lived out before the watching world. You know, there's biblical language in the New Testament for what do we mean when we talk about a faith that is objective and rational and and true, or, or personal experience that is robust and real and that gives true knowledge on that deeply personal level. And when we live in a way that is victorious and that brings lives together and is effective, we call that the three values, the three virtues of the New Testament, faith, hope, and love. And as we walk in these things, we discover these, this, these dimensions of our knowledge of God, and we live them out before the watching world, and we engage in the issues and the concerns that our world faces. Yes, we will have an effective Christian witness, and we will find in every generation people discovering new life in Christ. So that's where we want to begin our conference. We're going to just talk a lot over these next couple days about what does it mean to have a reasonable faith? What does it look like to cultivate a community in which there is visible love? What does it mean to live victoriously in such a way that our lives are a beacon of hope for lost people? Well, we got some uh, questions here. Some good ones. I uh, picked the ones I thought you could handle. Oh, man. Uh, Be gentle, Paul. All right, I'll try. Some softballs here. Okay. Now, first one. Um, so at the beginning, you were talking about a definition of, of knowledge. And, yes. and one, one person was wondering if you could uh, talk for a second about the difference between uh, spiritual knowledge of God and, and biblical faith, including doubt and uh, uh-huh. in, in that area, because it's... It doesn't seem that knowledge and belief are are equivalent. Okay, so knowledge and belief are not equivalent. It takes belief to possess knowledge, as we were saying. But on the knowledge that we have in this world is never complete knowledge. And so it can be true, but we don't have the whole picture. And for that reason, it is absolutely a part pretty much of universal Christian experience that we find ourselves at places of doubt periodically. We just can't put the pieces together between what we know propositionally to be true about God and the experience of our inner self as we're trying to move through life with all of its brokenness and with all of its heartache and difficulty. And so, yes, there's a, there is a place for doubt in the Christian life and there is also, it seems to me, an important pathway through that doubt. And as we march through that doubt and analyze the, the, the nature of our doubts that we find on the other side of that, and actually a, a deepened personal knowledge of God and a clearer understanding of what his word teaches about these things. Cool. That's good. Uh, someone else was mentioning, you know, in Romans 1, it talks about we live in a world that has repressed the truth. Yeah. And you, you were describing this dim picture of a world that's rejected objective that's truth. Right. Uh, to what extent do you believe that we as believers should be fighting for truth? Well, um, I don't know if fighting for truth is the right description that we're bringing here. Mm. We should live in the truth and we should speak the truth. And as we do that, I think it tends to cut through the cynicism of our culture because you're right, people have suppressed what they know to be true about God to maintain their revolt against him. Mm -hmm. And as we communicate the love, the goodness, the mercy of Jesus, of God through Jesus Christ in how we live, in the hope that we have, in the clarity of our message as we speak to the, 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 the thought frames of our culture, then there are many who are going to be um, uh, changed by that as, as they begin to re-evaluate their cynicism 
and they begin to revisit whether or not they want to continue on in, in their own hostility toward mm -hmm. God. And we will find that many people turn. Fighting for people. Fighting for people, not with people. Not for the truth, per That's se. That's right. That's good. Um, someone uh, um, somewhere here talked about her uh, rate, uh, recently. She's been trying to witness to a friend, mm -hmm. and their conversations have gone round and round with evidence, good, solid evidence for believing, and it seems mm -hmm. to be going nowhere. Do you have any advice for shifting her, her tactics towards the, the argument of love? Well, yeah. I mean, I think what we want to do is we want to, um, as we're developing relationships with our non-Christian friends, we want to expose them to the breadth of what knowledge is. And so we want them to experience uh, the, the witness of a loving community of people. We want them to connect with our Christian friends. We want them to be able to uh, recognize something of a quality of life between ourselves and our Christian brothers and sisters, something that within non-Christian people they long for, but they do not have. And that becomes a different kind of pathway to, to understanding, to mm. knowledge, because they're seeing something that they can't argue with. It's not an argument. It's a witness. It's, a, it's, an, ex, it's an exhibit, as Schaefer called mm. it, of who God is. Good. And this has this deep effect, as it did my friend Steve. Mm, that's good. We should pray for that sister reaching her friend. One last question. Um, uh, person picked up on your description of a postmodern culture where we have, it's resulted in a, um, a view of cultures as different and, 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 and it's, it's uh, separated our culture. Uh, they're wondering what are effective uh, methods for us to witness to minority cultures and what have we done as a church at Xenos to, to witness to, to minority uh, Okay, so I think big part of our witness to uh, parts of our culture that are outside the demographic yeah. that is the majority of, of any given church, and ours included, means that we, are, that we have to be intentional and to build bridges in those areas. And so what we've done over the years is build um, ministry in the South Linden community to set up ministry that is really uh, addressing the felt need of that community in the area of education. But beyond that, beyond programmatic things, there's also just that relational desire to move toward people and to, to share the love of Christ with people who are in a different place, whether they're refugees or, or minority communities in our, in our city or whatever it is, and, and to, again, embrace them into our fellowship, into our context, help them to understand, to help them see uh, the love of Christ for them mm -hmm. or to move resources their way in the name of Christ to meet that felt need, which enables us to then have some open dialogue. We're no longer a threat. We're, uh, we're an asset. We're people who are, who are here to help and here, who are here to share something that is sig so significant that it has, in a hostile cultural context, has created a certain number of people who are warm towards mm -hmm. them, who have moved towards them. And uh, people take notice of that. People respond. I love is universal. Love is universal. Good.